morning. Welcome to First Wesleyan Church. Thanks for being here this morning. Let's stand together and lift high the name of our God.
you are children of the Lord. As we prepare our hearts for communion this morning, I encourage you to ponder the words of this next song. It talks about all the way that our Savior has led us. And so as we sing this next song, may you think upon all that the Savior has done for you. May you know of his love for each of you. And may you see how he has led you so far. seated. I'm smiling because in the first service I, I was so nervous I didn't tell him to be seated. <laughs> so I made him stand up for all the songs, <laughs> okay. So he got a little reprieve, okay. 
My name is Ron Burkhalter. Uh, we go to the first service, and so some of you may not know me. Uh, just pinch hitting here a little bit this morning. Communion is a celebration of our redemption, redeemed by Jesus' blood. It's also a celebration of our reconciliation, and I think that's a key thing because what an unspeakable thing it is to be able to have fellowship with God. Have you ever thought about that? Celebration. And we're at the same time taking our place by the side of Jesus and recognizing ourselves as part of his kingdom, the kingdom of God that Daniel prophesied two and a half centuries before it came into being. And when he prophesied it, he said that kingdom will come. It was during the Roman Empire and he, when Jesus was here. And, uh, and he said it will never end. And uh, I, I think it's no mistake or, or, or no accident that in every gospel where Jesus uh, talks about this uh, supper, he sa he, he's not thinking about just remembering him. But in Mark 26, he says, I'm looking forward to drinking the cup with you in my Father's kingdom. In Luke 14, he says, I'm looking forward to the day when I drink it new with you in my kingdom. And in uh, uh, Luke 22, it reads, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And so we stand today with Jesus and in his kingdom and, uh, and with a vast millions of believers since that time who have stood with him in his kingdom. Some of them have witnessed by their blood. Some of them are witnessing today by their blood that they belong to his kingdom. And this is our allegiance this morning, standing with them together with Jesus, looking forward to this as we partake of uh, of the sacrament that he left us and told us to remember. The invitation is given by Jesus himself, I think, in Matthew 11, chapter 28 through 30, where he says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Now, maybe there are some here this morning or, or even one person who does not know Jesus as your Savior. And I really believe that that invitation is for you to come to know him. Personally, I know of two people who have come to know Jesus during a communion service. One of them was a great Anglican uh, young man who was studying for, for the ministry in the Anglican church. And when he went to college, they informed him that he would be required to take communion. And he was petrified at the idea of taking communion and not knowing Jesus. And so he began to seek God. And over the next few days and weeks, he sought God and God became more and more real to him so that on, on Easter Sunday morning, he was born again in the communion service. So our invitation is given to us. Uh, oh, I should tell you this. Pastor Mark and I will put, will put the emblems in your hand, okay? <laughs> that shows you how nervous I am. <laughs> The invitation again, listen to this invitation to you. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden 
is light. As you feel led of the Lord, you may come and, and share in communion this morning. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for you, preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. Take this and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed in him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, preserve your soul and body unto everlasting life. 
Drink this in remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Before we transition into a, another time of prayer, I have some photos of our missions team that left this last Friday to Acuna, Mexico. As you can see up here, this is our team arriving safely. And so thank you for your prayers so far that they are able to make it to Acuna. Um, the next slide here will show, actually, this is the house that the family is living in now that we're building for. To kind of put into perspective the dire need of a house for this family, I, I can't even fathom. Um, as we continue on here, we'll see the team being in prayer just around the ground and oh, just thank you for your prayers so far, and we have one more here where they've actually began to work on the site. Will you join me in a word of prayer today? And I think it is so appropriate that our prayer focus is Psalm 23. And those of you who don't know Psalm 23, it starts out with, the Lord is my shepherd. Will you stand with me? As we Approach our God, our King, in prayer this morning. Bow your heads and bow your hearts. O oh, mighty God, O oh Lord, you are our shepherd. We shall not want. You make us lie down in green pastures. You make us, you lead us beside still waters. God, you you restore our souls. You lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil, for you are with us. Your rod and your staff, they comfort us. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint our heads with oil, our cups overflow. Surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. And let us dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, we come to you this morning recognizing and adoring you as the great shepherd, the good shepherd. You have led us, Lord. You have guided us. You have sat us down in a place where we need no need besides you. And so we just want to worship you this morning and praise you for being the shepherd that does not forsake. Because God, to be, tell you the truth, we, we have fallen short of your glory. We have sinned. And God, we need to come to you, come in the name of Christ as we just partook in the sacrament that embolized the forgiveness of our sin. We come to you, come in the name of your Son before you, knowing that you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God, as I think across the world, I think of just the missions in Austin and Sabrina Blame and their mission to the Photozo people. God, we just pray that you continue to guide them with your rod. Even though they be in the valley of the shadow of death at times, we pray that you would remind them of your presence as their shepherd. Be with our sister church in Fargo, North Dakota, the story led by Pastor Wayne Coffey. 
God, may they feel your presence here this morning. May they know of your surely goodness and surely mercy that they can tap into. May they be a bright light in the community. And Father, I pray for the missions team. God, thank you so much for allowing them to come down there safely, to allow them to minister to this family that's in dire need. Lord, we ask for protection. We ask for guidance. But God, we ask for your presence to be with them as they impact this family. Be with the family. Encourage them. May they receive the gift of your grace. And Father, I pray for the individual who came in today with a burdened heart, a sad face, a heavy load. And I pray that you would remind them that you are the shepherd, the shepherd that comes alongside them and you restore souls. And we trust in you, our good shepherd. We trust in you to refresh us, to refresh us with your righteousness, with your goodness, for your name's sake. As we continue in service today, Lord, be with us with the word. Prepare our hearts, prepare our minds to receive the grace that will be flowing from your word that we may know you. Pray this in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So a couple of uh, announcements before we get into today's message. If you have not returned one of your baby bottles this past, um, for the Pregnancy Research Center, please turn those in. We want to get those in there. And thank you for providing those and supporting them. As I said last week, we've raised over $1,000 for this organization. So thank you so much for giving. Um, this Wednesday from 5.30 to 7.30, there is a youth kickball night. And so youth are welcome to hang out, kickball. There'll be some, a couple other things going on, but just a fun, fun time. And that will start at 5.30. Also, there is a prayer breakfast that is happening this Saturday. This is a wonderful time to come, pray on the behalf of the body, eat, have fellowship. So you are invited. That begins at 8 a.m. this Saturday. If you have your Bibles with you today, I'm excited. We're in the series of Deuteronomy. So if you could turn to Deuteronomy chapter 1. We're going to be at verse 19 through 30 today, and if, if you don't have your Bibles, it'll be on the screen behind you, and the Bible, the page number should be there as well. But today's, si um, today's sermon is called Big Fruit, Big Fear. Big Fruit, Big Fear, and this is an interesting title. I'm excited, and I'm going to explain a little bit of what that means later on, but I want to, I want to wake everybody else up this morning with a question, Okay. And I just want you to ponder it in your mind. I just want you to think about it. What would an opportunity of a lifetime look like for you? Just think about it. What would an opportunity of a lifetime look like for you? So when I was in sixth grade, I was really in basketball. I really liked playing basketball. I'd play basketball at Sioux Park. I'd play it at West Middle School. Any, any place I could play it, I would play it. And to be honest, it was probably more of an idol in my life than anything. But one of my dreams, any, any person's dreams that wants to play basketball, is to go to an NBA game, right? And I got the privilege of, back in about 2006, 2007, the Minnesota Timberwolves came to the Civic Center here in Rapid to play the Detroit Pistons. Was anybody there for that game? Everybody remember that game? Huh? Hey, there we are. Yep. And Matt, all right. Did you guys go? Awesome. Awesome. Nice. So I was there too. But one of the things that was a really cool privilege for that is not only was it an NBA game, but about an hour before admissions, you got to go in the game. They at a basketball camp with the NBA players that you could attend. 
And as a sixth grader, I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> this is my time to shine, right? I'm, I'm going to go in there and show them my skills. And what a wonderful opportunity. It was like a lifetime opportunity. I will say there was a little bit of disappointment. Um, and, and by the way, uh, before I get into that, this wasn't any like De- Detroit Pistons team. This was the Detroit Pistons team beat the Lakers with Kobe and Shaq. So they had like Rasheed Wallace, Ben Wallace, Chauncey Billups, Rick, Rick Hamilton. It was the team. And so it's like, I get to go play with them. That is awesome. But I went, there was a guy on Minnesota Timberwolves named Wally Serviak. Anybody hear that name? Yeah, he's a good shooter. That's the only thing I could do in basketball is shoot. I couldn't do anything else. So coming back to it, I was like, I brought my basketball card. And I'm like, I'm getting Wally Serviak's autograph. That's the one I wanted. And I see him on the court, and I beeline for it. And I'm like, maybe five feet away, and security steps straight in. And is like, nope, not today. And so a sad little sixth grader walked off. And a little bit of disappointment. I can't be too disappointed. I got to play with NBA players that day. So um, that was just uh, an opportunity of a lifetime for me in sixth grade to play and be around NBA players. You know, I'm probably five foot and they're seven foot, just the perspective there. And I want to bring this story up because we in America live in a land of opportunity, right? Like that's one thing we're known for. There's many, many opportunities we can get to. But to be honest, the thing I, I don't want to talk, talk about the, the American opportunity today. See, I want to talk about God-given opportunities. God-given opportunities, and more specifically, on how do we seize God-given opportunities. I want you to have this question in your mind. How do we seize God-given opportunities? And I want to clarify something. When I say God-given opportunities, a lot of us think, well, he's talking about a missionary that's going to go move across the world. Or he's talking about a call into ministry. No, 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 no. What I mean by God-given opportunities, I mean they can be pronounced as something as switching your career in the middle of your life to being a missionary or to just another, another career. Or it can be as simple as a small act of kindness. So I want to talk about how do we seize these moments? How do we seize God-given opportunities. See, and this is important, for if you're a Christian in the room, your aim is to glorify God. You are to glorify God, and you need to understand how to seize these moments to best God, give God glory. All right? So if you um, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 1 here, at verse 19, we'll be going through 19 through 33. Then we set out from Hurub and went through all the great and terrifying wilderness that you saw, and on the way to the hill country of the Ammonites, as the Lord our God commanded us, and we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Ammonites, which the Lord our God is giving us. See, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go! Up, take possession, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has told you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Then all of you came near me and said, Let us send men before us, that they may explore the land for us and bring us again, bring us word again of by the way we must go up and the cities into which we should come. The thing seemed good to me, and I took twelve men from you. One man from each tribe. And they turned and went up into the hill country. And they came to the valley of Ishkol and spied it out. And they took in their hands some of the fruit of the land and brought it down to us. And brought us word again and said, It is a good land that the Lord our God is giving us. Yet you would not go up but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord hated us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. We are going up. Where are we going up? 
Our brothers have made our hearts melt by saying the people are greater and taller than we are. The cities are great and fortified up in heaven. And besides, we have seen the sons of Anakin there. Then I said to you, do not be in dread or afraid of them. The Lord your God goes before you, will himself fight for you, just as he did for the Egyptians before your eyes and in the wilderness, where you have seen how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet in spite of this word, you did not believe in the Lord your God, who went before you in the way to seek you out to a place to pitch your tent in fire by night and cloud by day to show you where you should go. This is God's word. And what a privilege it is to read it here. Just to read it out loud, there's a benefit in that. To hear it. But before we dig further in the text, I want to explain, just back up a little bit, what's happening here. See, in the book of Deuteronomy, this first part, Moses is explaining of what happened in the Exodus in the book of Numbers. Okay? He's, basically, he's telling something. He's re-saying their history. But I think he's, he's doing it with a purpose. Okay? He's using his experience from his past to instruct them in a teaching point. And we all do this. Like, we all, like, have gone through something, and when we're trying to teach someone something, we'll say, well, this happened to me one time. Uh, for example, I was working at Sonic when I was mm, uh, going into my senior year of high school for the summer. And they were teaching me to clean behind the oven, all right? And they said, well, you've got to use a mop and, and scrub behind there and get all that grease off. But I'm like... Well, why can't we use a, a pressurized hose? They have one right there. And they're like, well, you know, you, you just, you don't do that. You know, you could, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. There's outlets everywhere, and you, you don't, you don't want to do that. And I'm like, all right. Well, the manager left, and guess what I did? <laughs> I went and grabbed the hose, and I started spraying on the floor, and I'm like, oh, man, this is so much easier oh, this is awesome, you know, I'm thinking about this, spraying on it on the floor, and then I'm like, oh, there's grease on the back wall. I've got to start spraying there. And I start shooting, and as you know, if you have the pressurized hose, water squirts out this way, right? You know, it's just not a full blast sometimes. It's like little trippets. And, I, you know, I, I notice there's an outlet coming up as I'm spraying, and I'm like, oh, I won't hit that. And a little of that water touches it, nothing happens. All right, I'm like, oh, okay, good, good. And I get close to it again, and this time, something happened. I remember the sound distinctly to this day. It went, <laughs> and flames start going up from this outlet. And I'm like, now i got to tell my manager. And so we go and we tell the manager, and he has to shut the power down for the entire store. Okay. A year later... Um, I was somehow hired at the Sonic again. <laughs> and as they're teaching me to clean behind the grill, guess who's teaching me? The manager that was teaching me before. And he says, now you know why we don't use the hose, right? <laughs> we find ourselves of Moses retelling history to make a point. This is where we come into today's text. And if you see... They, the first point I want you guys to see is this. We need to be aware of God-given opportunities. See, when we see here is that it's specifically said, um, um, it's, it's kind of subjunct, uh, it's within the text, sorry. It's within the text that the Lord was leading them to the promised land from the wilderness. Okay? They were leading them by cloud by day and fire by night. All right? And so they get to the promised land. And by the way, they let them through a wilderness. And they get to the edge of the promised land, and Moses says, This right here, verse 20, this right here, you have come to the hillside of the Amorites, 
which the Lord our God is giving us. See, there is an opportunity for the Israelites to go in and possess what God has called them to possess, right? But it's, it's interesting. Before I continue on, have you ever noticed the similarity of the Exodus event? And what I mean by that is when Israel was in slavery till they hit the promised land and mankind and the Christ event. See, Egypt, Egypt, the Israelites were in slavery. They were in slavery to the Egyptians. We, as humans, were enslaved to sin. All right? What, what f- ends up freeing them from sin is the death of a firstborn and the blood of a lamb that, that allowed the, the wrath of God to pass over them. Jesus being called the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. God's wrath passes over us. But it doesn't even stop there, right? They pass through the the Red Sea, and it's like this idea of like passing through the waters of baptism in our own faith. And then they're led into the wilderness by God's Spirit. This representation of the cloud and fire throughout Scripture just echoes the symbolism of God's Holy Spirit leading them through the wilderness to the promised land. And it's interesting that we in ourselves right now are walking, in a sense, in the wilderness until we inherit that eternal promised land. Isn't this interesting, the Exodus event? Like, it's just like a precursor of what Jesus came to do fully. And I want you to note this. Moses didn't get him to the promised land. He died right beforehand. But we have someone. We have God's son who gets us to the promised land, the eternal promised land. It's only by belief in Jesus Christ that we can come into this eternal inheritance But I want to go back. See, the Israelites were led through the wilderness, as it said here in 19 and 20, and we see it in 33 too. Fire by night, cloud by day. And you know what they were doing? They were walking literally by God's Spirit. They were walking by God's Spirit. We need to walk by God's Spirit. We need to walk in light of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 16 says this. I say... Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. This is a command for all Christians, to walk by God's Spirit, even if it means walking into a wilderness. A guy by Matthew Henry says this, Those who God brings into a wilderness, he will not leave nor lose there, but will take care to lead them in it. Lead them it. It was satisfaction to Moses and the pious Israelites to be sure that they were under divine guidance. Those who make the glory of God their end, the word of God their rule, the spirit of God the guide of their afflictions, the providence of God the guide of their affairs, may be sure that the Lord goes before them. Walk by God's spirit. In your everyday life, ask yourself, Am I walking by the Spirit? Reflect on it. Depend on it. For it was only by the Spirit that they made it to the promised land. Did you notice that? Like, that's how they got there. By God's Spirit leading them to the promised land. Depend on God's Holy Spirit. Depend on it. Like it's air. We see in verse 21... It says, see the Lord your God and set the, has set the land before you. Go, take possession as the Lord your God, the God of your fathers has told you. Do not fear or be dismayed. See, the second point I want you to see is this. We need to act on God-given opportunities. We need to act on God-given opportunities. They're led to the promised land, right? They're there. Moses says, this is what God is giving us. 
And they, they're like, they come up to Moses in, in Numbers. God tells Moses it's just a combination of everyone coming together saying, this is God's plan. Go send out spies into the land. They're acting upon it. And by the way, the word possess here, this is an important word in Deuteronomy, is used 52 times. 52 times throughout this. I think they're trying to get a point of go possess this land, right? Go possess this God-given opportunity. And we see that they take advantage of it. They saw the opportunity. They acted on it. They tasted the land and saw that it was good. It mentions fruit. Now, in this account, in Deuteronomy, he doesn't mention what kind, but in, in Numbers, it's, a, it's great. These are, these are pretty small grapes, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Lakin, do you like grapes? Yeah, here. Here. There you are. Don't eat them all at once. Or maybe that's not candy, so maybe you can. See? The fruit that they bring back, two men have to hold it on their shoulder between Two men, a, a, a stick, on the fruit they bring back. Now, I don't know if that's a lot of small grapes or big, big grapes. Like, it doesn't say. I kind of want to go with, like, the big, big grapes, like, big as my head, but I can't, I can't say that. And they taste and see that the land is good. I love the report in verse 25 that says this. It is a good land that the Lord our God has given us. When God gives us opportunities, it's a good opportunity. It may not feel like it in the moment, but in the end, it's a good opportunity. But you got to read verse 26. Yet you would not go up, but rebel against the command of your Lord, your God. They rebelled. They didn't go in. And I think what happened here is they show this. They, they go in. They taste that the land is good, right? But then they walk away. They want to go back to Egypt. They don't possess. And I think this actually brings out a struggle that the church struggles with today. See, I think we as Christians can be land tasters when we're meant to be land possessors. And let me explain this a little bit, okay? When there's an opportunity in our life to do something good for God, we dabble in it a little bit. We don't, we don't fully submerge ourselves. We dabble in it. And let, let me give you some examples. When, and these are just simple ones. Bible reading. How often do we hear, man, I struggle to get in God's word? How often do we hear that... We struggle to read day by day in God's word. How about Bible studying? Not only just reading it, but studying it, knowing it, putting it on your heart. How about prayer? Man, there's power in prayer. But sometimes we just dabble in it when we need it. And then instead of fully possessing it as being part of our own, serving, fasting. This one, this one convicts me, sharing our faith. I did it once, I'm good. No, no, not just once. <laughs> not just once. Go possess it. Live and share your faith. Being part of a small group. You know, we sometimes just bounce between small groups, and it's like, no, find a place where you can get connected, where you can have accountability, where you can take an opportunity to grow in the Lord. Having family devotionals, having an accountability partner, teaching. Pastor Steve last week talked about leadership. Where can you be a leader? Maybe it's an opportunity. Taking a job, serving the poor, knowing who your neighbor is, being still. See, I think a lot of these things we, we dabble in, but we don't possess it when we need to, when God is calling us to. There's a quote by a guy named um, Robert Coleman that says this. 
Undoubtedly, much of our efforts for the kingdom is dissipated for this reason. We fail, not because we do not do something, but because we let our little efforts become an excuse for not doing more. That hurts. I, when I read that, that hurt. I'm not going to lie. It was like a gut punch. I, I'm reading this too. And, and, I can't, and maybe you've got this figured out. But we're meant to be land possessors. We're not supposed to be tasters. Go possess it. Go own it. Take ownership of your faith and live it. We need to make these things our own. But we see that the response of the Israelites to the, to the report was fear. The fear of what the 12 spies have reported. They used excuses that the people are bigger than us. The cities are fortified and larger. They, they, they describe it as being as high as the heavens, the sky. By the way, they, they mentioned this name, the Anakin. Do you know who's, who's an ancestor of the Anakin? Goliath. These are giants. These are giants they're literally facing. I might be a little scared, not going to lie. Notice the command was, do not be afraid. Coming back to here is that the fear led to excuses that revealed their unbelief. Verse 32, in spite of this word, you did not believe the Lord your God. See, the overwhelming reality of their circumstances made them question the reality of God and who he is. This led them, their unbelief led them to miss a God-given opportunity. Howard G. Hendricks has a really interesting quote. Really, really interesting quote, and it says this. How big is your God? The size of your God determines the size of everything. If your God is small, pretty much everything else will be bigger than your God. But if your God is bigger than every situation that you come into, all of a sudden, these, these trials, these tribulations, these fears get a whole lot smaller in perspective of how big our God is. It was because of their, the Israelites' unbelief that they could not enter into the promised land. They couldn't seize it. And in fact, the best way to describe this is by using scripture, because scripture describes their, their unbelief. In Hebrews chapter 3, says this, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another daily, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end, as it is said today, if you, do, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts in rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Who was it? Was it, uh, was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of their unbelief. That's scripture just commentating on scripture. It was because of their unbelief that they could not enter in. But there's, 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 there's good news. <laughs> okay, there's good news. 
And here's what it is. See, my third, third point is this. See, we seize God-given opportunities by submission that stems from belief. Want to know what we can do different than the Israelites? We can believe. We can believe our God. And in believing our God, we submit the circumstance, the opportunity that has fallen before us into his hands, saying, our God is bigger. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. See, it is a surrendering of the moment to God saying it is his. It is living the saying, not saying, living the saying, not thy will, but yours. As Jesus did in Gethsemane, as he prayed right before he went to the cross. Take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours. If you want to be fully aware of the opportunities God is putting before you and act on them fully, not just tasting it, but act on them fully, it stems from belief in who God is. It is submitting the opportunity to God and belief that he has better plans for your life, even when it brings you to the point of fear or the point of going through a dry desert in your life. We need to believe in God. We need to believe in it. It's so important. If you're here today and you have not made a commitment to Jesus Christ to believe upon the name of Jesus and know him as Savior and Lord, believe on him. Believe on him now. Because, my friend, it's a dire need. Repent of your sins. Call on the name of Jesus and you will be saved. We need to believe. Because when we we seize God-given opportunities by submitting ourselves and believing in God. As we conclude here today, I want to I bring this into the room. There's some of us in here that, in a point of, that, that are in a point of decision-making. Either to seize the God-given opportunity that's in your life a following in belief that leads to obedience or to choose the desert, the wilderness of sin that you just came out of. I have some encouragement for you. Oh, Caleb, can you pull up Deuteronomy here? We'll start at verse 20. Do you know how many times it mentions what God does in this passage. Verse 20, God is giving you. Verse 21, God set before you. Verse 25, God is giving. Verse 30, there's two things here. God is before you. God fights for you. And going back to, I believe it's verse 32. Or verse, verse 31, God carried you. He's carried to you to where you are right now. He's carried you. Believe in God. Look at the works he's done in your life. Look at the testimonies you have. And believe in him. Because if you believe in him, if you truly believe in him, and you surrender it, we get the promised land. We possess it. Go in light of this and believe in the name of our God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Will you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. And we just want to praise you about how you've been in our life. The fact that you have given us opportunities. You want us to glorify you. You want to use us. You think we're of worth when we, when we shouldn't be. And Father, you've set before us plans that are beautiful. Plans that if we believe in your name, we will inherit. If we submit before you from that belief, we will come to possess. 
And God, we lift your name for your faithfulness. The Israelites rebelled, and yet you still remained. May that be true in our lives, that when we rebel, you are still there. And let us press in to you. Help us to live a life that go and possesses the land fully. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.